Welcome uh, to the BNH event space. Uh, my name is Rob Sylvan. I'm uh, doing a presentation this afternoon on improving your Lightroom and Photoshop workflow with Wacom tablets. And I want to just tell you a little bit about myself in terms of how my approach to this uh, presentation is, is, is coming from. I say I'm here representing Wacom. I, I use their products. I love their products. Um, but I'm a photographer and I'm an educator. Uh, I'm a writer. And one of the things I've done the most over the last 11, almost 11 years now, is I've been the Lightroom help desk for uh, for Kelby One, what was used to be NAP, Kelby Training, Kelby One. Um, so I've spent a lot of time helping people using Lightroom. Uh, now Lightroom Classic. Lightroom CC a little bit, won't go there. It's a whole can of worms. Um, but uh, I've seen a lot of different workflows, and I've benefited from helping other people and being exposed to these workflows. And so what I'm trying to bring to you is the collective wisdom that I've gained from working with folks uh, over this last decade. Um, and then kind of channeling that through these products. So I've got two things with me today. I'm going to be primarily using one, but I want to talk about them so you kind of have a sense. I think most people are probably familiar, when you think of Wacom, of, of the tablet. And this is the Intuos Pro. Uh, this is the medium size. And this is what I used for, for many years. And th what I loved about the, the medium size Intuos Pro is that it's about the size of my laptop and it would fit right in with my laptop bag, and I could bring it pretty much anywhere I went. It's relatively light. Um, it used to be a, a separate module for wireless. Now it's built in wireless, so it's Bluetooth connected, although it's not on at the moment. And I would use this with my Mac. Um, in the last about almost about a year now, though, I was looking for a window, uh, Windows computer to because I have to stay fluent in both uh, for the help desk support that I do and the teaching that I do. Um, and so, when Wacom came out with their Mobile Studio Pro, um, it's a Windows 10 machine that essentially takes this tablet. I don't want to touch it because I don't want to throw off the uh, projector, but it takes this functionality, which is a this is a touch sensitive tablet. So this is a touch sensitive tablet as well. Has the same express keys and the touch ring um, and uses the same Pro Pen 2. All bundled into a Windows 10 computer. Right? And this Windows 10 computer um, has US three USB-C uh, slots. It does have a card reader. Um, so I still have my MacBook Pro that I love that has the built-in card reader still and the built-in HDMI, all right? I still, you know, kind of old school on that. But what I love about this is that it has the built-in card reader. It's an SD slot, um, even has a, its own head, headphone jack. Um, and as, I'm, as I kind of transition from this to this, although I do go back and forth, um, I really love the ability to really feel like I'm really hands-on with this device in a way that with my laptop, I'm obviously I'm very keyboard driven um, in incorporating with a tablet. But this, I don't know, if you've ever used a, a, any type of a tablet, an iPad or an Android tablet um, that's touch, you, you're, it's so intuitive, you're, just, you're doing stuff and you're not really thinking about it. And that's what I really like about the Mobile Studio Pro. I do also use with the Mobile Studio Pro uh, a Bluetooth wireless keyboard. All right, this is just one that I had, a uh, relatively inexpensive one. Uh, there is also one from Wacom. Um, but any Bluetooth keyboard that you may have or would like to pick up works really well with this. And what I'll show you as I've, uh, as I've been using it, I've tried as much as I can to incorporate the features and functions of the Mobile Studio Pro to use the keyboard less. All right, and I'll try and show you how you can do that if that's something you're interested in doing. So this, uh, this whole presentation, I'll be able to spend a lot of time in Lightroom, go a little bit in Photoshop, um, and I'll be talking through how I use the tablet to do those things. Some of it you'll see. Um, and I will uh, pause uh, about maybe halfway through if there's any questions. Um, and, uh, and then at the end, we'll take some questions as well. If anyone is watching on the Facebook live stream, I won't be watching those questions during, but if you leave questions on there, I'll go onto the Facebook page when this is all done and wrapped up, and I'll go through and answer any questions that you might have. So feel free to post them up there, and then you'll have to check back later on uh, to see the, the answers on that. So um, Lightroom's whole purpose was to take this, what used to be this Photoshop bridge and camera plugin, 
powerful, still works, still people still use it, but it wasn't necessarily very efficient uh, as a workflow tool specifically to photographers. Photoshop serves many different masters, many different disciplines. And so the idea was to take that camera raw plugin power and put it inside of a different wrapper that really was geared to nothing other than digital photography from, from capture all the way through to output. Right? And so as we're using Lightroom over the years, we're always looking for new ways to make it more and more efficient. Um, I know a lot of photographers enjoy the post-processing. I do. I know plenty who just want to spend time behind the camera and as little time doing the processing as possible. Um, and there's room for, for all, there's room for everybody at the Lightroom table, right? There's no, no one workflow. I'm not dogmatic in that. Um, but I do have some opinions based on what I've seen. So one of the things I want to just start off with is, is just an import. So I do have some photos on my memory card, and I'm just going to bring them in there. And I just want to talk through this import process because it's designed to try to hmm, look at that uh, speed things up. Now, when you pop a card in there, if you have a card reader, it works the same way. Lightroom automatically was configured to open up the import dialog, and the memory card is showing. So we see that there are some photos that are already in Lightroom and some that are not. So I had some already on this card that I had shot at home, and then when I had some time today, I just walked down to Times Square and just took some pictures just so I'd have something to bring in and, and walk you through that process. Now, how many folks are using Lightroom Classic? Anybody using an older version than Lightroom Classic? All right, great. So um, this is really focused on Lightroom Classic, but there's nothing. If I do t talk about something that's maybe pertains to uh, one of the perpetual license of Lightroom 6, um, I'll mention that. But, but for right now, everything that I'm going to show works for the previous version of Lightroom as well. Um, so when we're bringing photos in, you may or may not want to bring them all in at once. All right, There's only 43 photos here. Um, but I'm going to kind of break this down just so you can see how you can take this in smaller chunks. So if you don't want to bring everything in at once, there's some bu buttons on the bottom for check all and uncheck all. And I'm just going to uncheck all of those. Now, if I want to bring in maybe just the first 10 or so, I'm just going to select one. And then I can hold down the Shift key. Now, I do have my keyboard in front of me. It's actually not on at the moment. But built into the side of the Walking Mobile Studio Pro, we have these Express keys. Right? And I've configured the express keys to do different functions. And we're going to look at what those things are. But for now, just to let you know that one of the things I have is a shift key. Right? That way I can have my left hand uh, ready on these keys as I'm working and the pen in my right hand. A word about that. I'm actually a lefty. All right? um, maybe by virtue of being a lefty uh, in a righty's world, I'm a little bit more adaptable to using both hands. Um, both the Walk and Mobile Studio Pro and the Intuos, they can be configured for either hand. So it's whichever hand you feel most comfortable with, you can use. I actually recommend being comfortable using both hands in this type of environment, because why not get both hands on there? I mean, if you were doing woodworking, you wouldn't just put one hand behind your back and use a hammer, right? So get both hands in there and, and get them involved. In Lightroom's interface, um, some things work better when you're using your right hand or your left hand. So for example, all the develop module sliders are on the right hand side. If you're a lefty and you put your hand on to move a slider, your hand is blocking the screen. So using my right hand for those things, I can still see the image. So um, with any new input device, there's a learning curve. Um, I would, would encourage you to kind of push through that and, and really experiment what works best. And I'll switch hands as I'm, as I'm working too. But for the most part, I have this set up for my left hand to be working with the express keys, the touch ring, the touch functions and gestures, which we'll get into. And if I have the keyboard out, I'll have that going too. But if I'm on a plane or doing something, I took the bus down from New Hampshire, um, I won't pull all that stuff out. So I just have this sitting out either on my lap or on the table, and I'm just trying to do everything I can right inside of here. But I digress. So if I hold down the Shift key, um, and you can see if I hold down the, some of the buttons, you'll see that 
heads up display come up there. That's something you can have on. It's really helpful in the beginning so you can kind of learn these. Um, and that's something you can turn off if you find that that is annoying. So I'm going to hold down the shift key and just select this one down below. And all the photos in between become selected. Now all I have to do is check the box in one, and all of those are now selected for import. All right, so to make this import process faster, the main part of an import is really doing two things. It's a handshake between the Lightroom catalog and each photo that says, the catalog says, hi photo, nice to meet you. Can you tell me about it, a bit about yourself? And it brings in all that EXIF metadata that gets added to the catalog. The import may also involve a copy or a move operation. I don't recommend using the move operation, but in this case, we're going to use a copy. And so Lightroom is making this process go a little faster by saying, OK, I'm going to take your photos from the memory card. I'm going to copy them to the destination of your choosing. So really, the most important panel on this import dialog, once you select your source on the left, is to choose your destination on the right. All right, And so for the most part, I work with, when I'm bringing new photos in, I store them on the local internal hard drive. This has about a 515 um, gigabyte drive, very similar actually to my MacBook Pro. And then everything eventually gets offloaded onto here. All right. But for now, I'm just going to be working with, uh, with what's on the internal hard drive. But however you like to do that, Lightroom will accommodate that. So the two panels I like to have open in, in this process is the source and then the destination, just so that I can see what I've chosen. Then there are some other panels up above the top here that are, are really designed to help you move things along and try to do multiple, multiple things in one particular move. So what I mean by that is if I go to this file handling panel, one of the things I can do is build one-to-one -one previews. So inside of Lightroom, we have this catalog file that stores all the work that you're doing. Every time you move a slider, touch a button, that gets stored in the catalog. Lightroom also creates what's called a preview, so essentially think of it as a JPEG, and it stores it in a special cache file right alongside that catalog. So when we're looking at our thumbnails inside of Lightroom in the library module, we're not actually looking at our photos, we're looking at these previews that Lightroom has rendered. All right. And then once those photos start coming in, one of the first things that I like to do, probably you too, is zoom in to see, did I get this focused or not? All right. um, now, I intentionally took a bunch of panning shots, so nothing's going to be in focus. All right. uh, but I was having fun down in Times Square uh, doing that. But one of the things I like to do is, is zoom right in. So what I used to do, and we're going to come back and look at what we can currently do, is have this uh, build preview set to one-to-one. -to -one. What that tells Lightroom to do is once these photos are copied to the destination, Lightroom's going to automatically kick into gear and start rendering out full-size one-to-one previews for each of these imported photos. That way, once I'm ready to start zooming in and moving through these, those previews are done and done. I'm not, it's not doing that behind the scenes while I'm working. All right. Now, another thing I can do is add these photos to a collection. All right. Now, I happen to have a collection um, inside of here that I might want to use. All right. They're called demo. So I'm just going to select that collection. So these photos are going to be copied to the destination that I choose, but they're also going to be added to a collection at the same time. All right. Now, collections are just like virtual folders inside this catalog. It's a way to group photos from wherever they happen to be stored and have them in one place. All right. It's all referencing that same photo based on that information during this handshake. Lightroom literally writes down the path from on Windows from the uh, drive letter, folder, 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 all the way down to the file name. On Mac, volume name, folder, 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 all the way down to the file name. That piece of information is really important because that's what Lightroom uses to find the photos each time. When I have photos on this drive and this drive is not connected, Lightroom is, is saying, hey, I can't, I can't find them. I can't access them, but because I have that preview cache, I can still show you the thumbnails for all of those. All right, And so you can still work with photos that are offline. All right, so I've got my file handling set up. I'm going to add these to a collection. I can choose to rename them. It's totally optional. Some people like to rename after the import, because if you're shooting for a client, and you go through, and maybe you delete a few, and then you turn in your files, and there's gaps in your numbering, somebody might say, well, where happened to 101? And you don't want to say, well, that wasn't very good. I'm not going to show you that one. So sometimes it's worth going through, uh, separating the wheat from the chaff, and then rename inside of the library module. That way, your sequence is all nice and tight, and there's no gaps. Right? But I'll just leave this set to rename for now. And then we have apply during import. 
So we can actually apply a preset, a develop preset, which I won't do at the moment, and we can apply a metadata preset. All right, things like your copyright information, your contact information, any additional information that you might want to add, maybe a job number or location or things like that, all right? But I just have a very basic metadata preset that includes my contact and copyright information, all right? And now my destination. Now once you've got that figured, if that's what you're gonna use consistently, as soon as you hit import, that all those settings become sticky, and Lightroom will use those uh, moving forward. Another thing you can do just to speed things up is you can create what's called an import preset, right? And I have a number of different presets. It's hidden down here at the bottom, but once you've configured all of these settings, you can come down here to say, save current settings as a new preset, type in a name for that preset, all right? And you might notice there's a little keyboard that pops up. As soon as I enter into a field, this little virtual keyboard pops up and I can use that. Now I can use my regular keyboard, but sometimes I find that if I don't have this out, I can just type something in here uh, instead, all right? So Wacom virtual keyboard. That, that's part of the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro. I think it's actually part of the Windows 10 operating system, to be honest, but it's built right in here. All right, um, and I'm just gonna call this one-to-one uh, -one something like that, all right? And click Create. So now all I have to do is actually just look for that preset and I'll know that all of my settings are dialed in. Lightroom actually has this compacted import screen. So down here at the bottom, um, see where my cursor is here, there's this little disclosure triangle. If you ever open up Lightroom and hit, click, click Import and you get this, this is the compacted import screen. And you can see at a glance what's happening here. So here's your source. Here's what's happening, in this case, copy, and here's where it's going. Those are the three most important things, right? I look down here at the bottom, I see my presets already loaded up. I can see that my metadata presets loaded up. Here's what's gonna happen. It's gonna ignore duplicates and make one-to-one -one previews. It's gonna rename based on this, and this is where they're gonna go, all right? Right to my imported photos folder. So I'll click import, and now that process has begun, all right? Now, once these photos appear, these are all raw photos, um, what Lightroom has to do is it takes that embedded JPEG and throws it out. Let me turn off my speaker, sorry, so that we're not hearing that each time. Um, it takes that JPEG out and replaces it with uh, Lightroom's default rendering for that particular camera model. So this happens to be from a Nikon D850, and so Lightroom has whatever the default settings are for that particular camera model, it takes that JPEG that the camera made, takes it out, and sometimes you'll see those previews change a little bit. You might see color, saturation change. Say you shot in a black and white mode, but you shot in RAW, you'll see all those black and white images change the color because Lightroom doesn't understand the in-camera styles that you might have chosen, okay? But we're gonna come up to a way that we can uh, customize that default setting to how we'd like to make it, right? So now I want to go through these and see um, if, I, if I like any of them or I want to keep them, all right? And now one of the ways that I find is the most useful to do that is to make use of the flags that Lightroom has. So this is why I start to use uh, some of the other express keys and some of the on-screen controls that you can create as well. So I'm going to press uh, on my express keys. I have one button here that pops up this little movable on-screen uh, set of buttons, all right? I, the bottom express key pops up another series of buttons that are over here on my left-hand side. And the bottom button on this particular on-screen uh, display here opens up a third one over here on the right-hand side, all right? And so when I'm working in Lightroom, I usually have all three of those up on screen, and it allows me to not have to use my keyboard pretty much at all, because this really covers most of the things that I do inside of Lightroom. So one of the things I like to do is clear out some space uh, for the photos and make the interface kind of scaled back, all right? So one of my buttons I mentioned before is the shift key, all right? One of the buttons I have incorporated into this on-screen um, is the tab key. So if I hold down shift and tab, I can immediately push all the panels right out of the way and just have my thumbnails up. Right. Um, 
I can also, using touch, I can zoom in just by that pinch and zoom, just like you would do on your phone, all right, and change the size of my thumbnails, all right. Um, but what I also want to do is I want to be able to zoom in on these and see did I, is the focus good enough on this panning shot to keep it or not, and then to use my flags to kind of mark them to keep or delete, but also move through this process quicker than when I'm talking like this. One of the ways that is important for, for this to work is under the photo menu, we have this option for auto advance. It probably is turned on by default, but if it's not, you wanna see that that auto advance is checked. What that does is, so if I select on this first photo, I can come over here, and I'm just gonna double tap on this to see it in loop view, a little bit bigger, all right? Um, I have buttons over here to go back to grid. If I wanna see this zoomed in really close, I have a key, uh, my Z key, programmed into this on-screen display, and I can zoom in just by tapping that once. I tap that Z again, I'm right back down to grid view. When I zoom in, because I set those previews to render one-to-one, -one, I'm not waiting for that loading. That already happened, all right? And so if I decide that this one's good enough, um, I can now come over here and say, oh, I'm gonna keep that one, I'm gonna hit the P key. As soon as I hit the P button on this display, the pick flag was applied to that photo and it automatically advanced me to the next one. All right, so now I can do that same thing. Z, zoom in, that one's not so great. Hit the X key and move through. So I won't do that for every one of these because it's just so you can get the idea, but I can very quickly move through and flag or reject these. Now, if I come up to one and I'm like, well, I'm not really sure if this is one that I want to keep, but I want to keep this process moving because you don't want to get hung up when you're just sitting on the fence. I have the U key that's also incorporated on here. U is unflag, right? They already come in unflagged. That's the default state. But if I just hit the U key, because that auto advance is turned on, it triggers the auto advance. So that way, I'm really just keeping my left hand over here, my right hand on these buttons right here, and I can just move through these um, really quickly. Now, some people also might like to apply a star rating if there's one that, that's like a real standout, um, and they wanna mark that to not only keep it, but maybe that's the one that the client might love or they might love. So when auto advance is turned on, as soon as I hit P or, or U or X, or even I have the number one and number zero uh, on here, it automatically advances to the next one. But if I hold down the shift key and hit P, it disables that auto advance for that moment. So I stayed on that particular photo. If I wanna mark that one as a one star, I'll take my finger off the shift key. Now I hit the one button. Now it has a one star rating as well, and then it auto advanced onto the next one. All right. So if you had a shoot of hundreds of images, using this workflow, I find um, makes it go a whole lot faster. And you can certainly do, and this is what I would do on here with my keyboard and this, I would do the same exact thing, except this hand would be on the keyboard and my other hand would be on the pen. All right. So I just find this way I'm right all in here. I don't have to really deal with the keyboard. But everything I'm showing you here works just as well and just the same using this, this setup as well. All right, so now that I've gone through that, if I wanna bring back all my panels, again, hold down the shift key with my finger and just hit tab, and that brings all my panels back. All right, so really quick going through that. Well, what if we just take one of these, um, and I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna right click on this, and I wanna go to this collection demo. All right, so how did I right click? So on my pen, um, there are two buttons, there's a bottom button and a top button. So aside from just the pen itself, where I can tap and, and drag uh, and brush, I can configure these two buttons to do different things. When I first started using this, I had the bottom button configured as the right click. But what I found is that that was a little bit awkward for me, and what I actually prefer is to have the top button as my right click. So if I'm using the pen, and one of the settings here, I'm gonna pull up the settings so you can see what I'm talking about, is this hover cursor. So I'm just moving the pen actually above the screen, all right, I'm about maybe an inch above the screen, and you can see the pen, the cursor's moving around. I'm not touching the screen at that moment. But I can trigger the right, essentially the contextual click, right click, control click, whatever you wanna call that, uh, right from that button. And I find it easier for me to do that up here. The bottom button I have configured for the Alt key or the Option key. 
depending on Mac or Windows, all right? And the Alt key is like a superpower inside a Lightroom. For all, you can do all kinds of things that we're going to see just by having that Alt key engaged. So by having that Alt key right at the tip of my finger when I'm doing things, um, okay, go away. Internet security, server not found, okay. Um, I find that to be uh, a real time saver. So instead of looking at some of those, let's talk a little bit about how we can actually make some adjustments and so you can get a sense of what the, what the pen can do. So I have this gray image and I'm gonna take this into develop and one of the buttons on I have configured on here is the D key for, uh, for develop module. And up at the top I have K for the adjustment brush. And so, one of the powers of the pen is pressure sensitivity, all right? Whether or not pressure sensitivity happens is really software dependent, all right? And Lightroom does not have as much pressure sensitivity as Photoshop. Photoshop is the king of pressure sensitivity and using your brush. But there is some pressure sensitivity in Lightroom when you're using, say, the adjustment brush. And so I just want to show you what that looks like. So I'm just going to take this brush, and I just have this 50% gray image because so it's a little bit easier to see. And I'm going to take my exposure all the way up to plus four, and I'm just going to brush on here. And I'm pressing, you know, as normal, you know, kind of hard. And you're seeing the full plus four exposure happening on there. But if I take that same brush without changing any settings and just use a lighter touch, I can paint that exposure, even though it's plus four, at less than plus four. All right. So obviously, there's probably really no reason you would ever use plus four as a, as a setting, but just so you can see the difference in there. So when you're doing different brush adjustments inside a Lightroom, if you do control the, the amount that you're pressing down on the brush, you can kind of nuance that brush and build that uh, adjustment that you're applying on there. All right. So I'm going to get rid of that, and I have the delete key as one of my other buttons incorporate it right in there again. So I'm just keeping my hands right on the keyboard. So let's look at something that's a little bit nicer to look at than a 50% gray image. Um, and what what you can do in, in Lightroom, to, again, to kind of build things, uh, speed things up. So let me make this a little bit bigger. So maybe a little bit smaller. So I have these two photos. I've been thinking about uh, coming from New Hampshire where we're getting 18 inches of snow today and we had 18 inches of snow last week and probably 18 inches coming next week. Um, I'm thinking about spring and so I went to find some spring images and uh, in my backyard I have a bunch of blue bluebird houses and what I would often do uh, is I'll take my camera and use the intervalometer and just park it in front of the birdhouse and set it to take a picture every X number of minutes or seconds and leave it go out there for a couple hours and I'll just set it and forget it and I'll come back later and grab the memory card. And I went through and I pilled out two images that, um, that I liked. Uh, from, from that series, and you could see the babies are in there, and at one point the father was on there bringing in some breakfast, and then mom appeared uh, also bringing some in. And I wanted to uh, process those and then merge them into one image, all right? And so uh, bringing these on over to the develop module, if I want to process these two images the same way, Lightroom has, down at the bottom here, we have, usually it's set to sync. We can turn this on to auto sync, and now any adjustment that I make to this active photo will also be applied to the other selected photo. And I could have five, 10, 100 other photos selected, and every adjustment I'm making is now going to be applied to all of those same photos. All right. Um, and so I'm going to hit reset just to start it off because I'm not sure what I may have done on these. So I'm just going to reset them back in, to, to the beginning. Now, the other thing that um, Lightroom has uh, that's useful is our presets, all right? So develop presets. And you can create and customize your own develop presets. Another useful feature inside of Lightroom to kind of speed things up that I, you may notice if you're familiar with it is solo mode, all right? Instead of having every panel expanded at once, what solo mode says is only one panel can be open at a time. And as soon as you open another panel, it's going to close any particular open panel. 
The way to get solo mode to come up is right click, so I'm just pressing the second button on the pen, and I come down here to solo mode, it's checked, and now when I click on one panel, it closes the other panel. It keeps me from having to scroll up and down lots of times trying to find the panel that I want to work on. Now a new feature inside of Classic that came out in the last update, 7.2, um, is a revamped auto button. All right? It's not even called auto tone anymore, it's called auto settings because it includes more than just the tonal values, it also includes potentially vibrance and saturation change. So if I just use it as a starting point and hit the auto button, using the, um, the, this new AI, but also machine learning, they actually had uh, photographers who did a bunch of editing and they incorporated how these photographers would process the images to make this auto settings button more intelligent. All right? Now, it doesn't mean it's perfect, but I think it's really gotten a lot better. But for my taste, I find that sometimes it goes a little too far on vibrance and saturation. So what I often will do is I created a preset that just will zero out vibrance and saturation. So I have one preset that I can just tap and auto is turned on. If it looks a little too saturated for me, I can come down to my zero saturation and vibrance, keeping the auto tones that, that were already dialed in and just turning off that vibrance and saturation. I might change it myself, but sometimes I find, my, for, my, for my taste, I like that a little bit better. Um, going further down to my preset list, you might notice, let me just turn this on screen display off for a minute so you can see. So inside of my preset panel, you'll see that they're numbered, all right? The reason why I number these is because the preset panel is alphanumerically ordered, all right? One of the best things you can do to make your workflow more efficient is to keep things in a consist consistent place so you can develop the muscle memory to go to where things are. So for, for presets that I use often, I number them. So I number the folder, and then I number the presets inside of it in the order that I often will, will work down through them, all right? And that just keeps things organized for me, and I don't have to go hunting up and down trying to find the one that I, that I really liked, all right? So one of the other uh, presets that I often use is enable profile correction. So I'm gonna come over to my um, lens correction panel and over to profile, and we can see that my remove chromatic aberration and enable profile are both unchecked, all right? And that's the default setting. But if I want to just enable that, I have a preset that all, it, all that's in that preset is to check both of those boxes. And you can see that the image um, distortion correction was applied and then the vignette removal was also applied. Just by that one tap and those boxes got checked. And just by having that turned on, Lightroom automatically looked at the metadata for that photo, determined what camera and lens I was using and applied the correct profile on top of that. Sometimes when you're doing things in Lightroom, if you're ever noticing a performance hit, although really the, the amount of performance improvement that's come in Classic in the last couple of updates has been really, really welcome. But sometimes I've noticed like for spot removal, that's one of the more heavy lifting ones. If you have your lens correction turned on and then are also doing a spot removal, sometimes that can slow things down a little bit. So I have another preset that will just disable the enable profile correction. So I can toggle that particular one on and off if I need to just take that out of the equation and then turn it right back on again. Because Lightroom, you think about it, somebody juggling three balls, okay, Lightroom is working really hard, throws that profile correction, now it's got another ball in there, now you're doing spot removal, because Lightroom is working on the fly, making all these updates from the raw data every time you move a slider, all right? So it's a lot of math going on. So taking that one ball out of the equation just gives it a little chance to breathe. If you never need to do that, that's even better, but that's why I have that one turned on there. And then another feature that I like to use turn that back on, is auto level, all right? This one wasn't particularly looking crooked to me, but hitting that auto level, I feel like that actually looks a little straighter. <laughs> um, so if you're taking a lot, of, a lot of photos and you're noticing that they're listing, all right? If you're, for me, even though I had this on a tripod, I obviously it was a little bit off. Um, 
inside of our transform panel, under upright, there's a level button, right? And this automatically looks at the image and, and applies a level correction. Doesn't always do it perfectly, all right? But sometimes it just, in a single click, if it looks better, then, then you're done, all right? So if I'll just turn that back off, and you can see, okay, yeah, that was a little bit, little bit off, all right? So those are the things that I have as my kind of go-to uh, controls. Now, in talking about colors, Question about the uh, presets. Yeah. Um, on the auto preset, if you click in the, if you've already clicked auto in the in the uh, grid in the library mode, and you go over to develop, um, the and you do a preset that shows all the auto quote numbers, the slider settings, um, isn't that photo specific? Um, so the way the auto adjustment works, yeah, so, thank you, Aaron. So the question was about using auto in, in grid view. So let me jump on over to grid view here. All right, and inside the quick develop panel, we also have an auto button there, Is all right? Where you use the auto? No, I use it in the basic panel of the develop module, all right? Um, so what you wanted to do is to look at each image and analyze it individually as opposed to applying the settings from one to the other image. Now these images were shot within the same environment and within you know, minutes or whatever, so there's not too much difference between them. But if you're working in grid view and using auto button, it's gonna apply an, auto, an individual auto correction to each of the selected images. Um, so here I am in develop with um, auto sync turned on, all right? And when I click auto, it's also doing that individual uh, analyzation of the of the image Where to make them right here. Ah. All right, you're welcome. All right, so um, what I wanted to show you was down here in the camera calibration panel. All right, so. When it comes to how the colors appear inside a Lightroom, this is actually one of the most important panels uh, for controlling those colors. By default, Adobe Standard is the profile that gets applied to all photos. Now each camera that's supported, um, every time a new camera comes out, a new RAW format comes out, you have to wait for the next update of Lightroom and Camera Raw to get that, in, uh, that support, all right? So, the default profile is Adobe Standard. Now you can see I have a bunch of other profiles in here, and this is really gonna be dependent on two things. The camera, most of all, right? But I also have um, a third party thing from Visco that also has a bunch of, of different camera profiles for, for emulating different film um, looks that are in here as well. So if you don't have Visco installed, you won't see those, but depending on the camera model you have, you're gonna see some different number of profiles here. And you can change these, and by changing them, it's gonna have a really different look. So I'm gonna choose camera landscape, because that's gonna give you a much more saturated, more contrasty look. Not necessarily the one that I like, but just so you can see the difference, as opposed to a neutral, which is much flatter, um, much less saturated. So choosing your profile here, it's probably something you want to do at the very beginning because you don't want to go through and adjust all your image, then come down to this panel and change this, and then have to go back and readjust things. All right. So one of the ones that I particularly uh, prefer is is the camera standard, and I just like that a little bit better over the Adobe standard as a starting place. This is totally subjective and. No problem if you like a different one and you hate camera standard, all right? But this is something that you need to decide and figure out what you like best, all right? So now that I have these two images, you know, looking well enough, um, I could do, obviously I could do a lot more, but let's just say that I'm satisfied with uh, how they each look, all right? And they look good enough. So what I wanna do next is I wanna send these on over to Photoshop. So with them both selected here in grid view, I'm gonna, again, use my contextual menu. I'm gonna come down to edit in, and I'm gonna use this opening layers in Photoshop down at the bottom of the edit in menu, all right? That same menu is accessible by going to the photo menu, then down to edit in, and you'll see all those same options. But because I'm in there and I have that right on my pen, I just use that, that contextual click all the time. So what's happening now is those raw files were now being rendered, sent over from Lightroom, 
opened up into Photoshop, and then Photoshop is putting them both in one document on two different layers. All right. A lot faster than opening them up both into Photoshop and then having to hold down the Shift key and drag one on top of the other to get them into one document. So you can do that right from Lightroom, a whole lot faster. So I'm gonna, again, hold down the Shift key and select both of my layers at once because what I want uh, Photoshop to do is to automatically align those two images because obviously the birds move, but the rest of the, the, the birdhouse and the fence and stuff should be aligned perfectly for this to work. All right, and so that was a little bit off, but now that I, if I turn off my visibility of my layers, the birdhouse is staying the same, and you can see there's the two different birds, all right? And all I wanna do is bring in Papa Bird at the same time as Mama Bird, um, so I have one composite image that has the whole family uh, posing for, for a shot, all right? So if I was doing this for another project, and I tell my students at college, always double click on your layer, and rename that layer to something that makes sense to you instead of just the names that are on there. But I'm not gonna go through that, but good practice, rename your layers to make them more logical, all right? So what I wanna do is apply a layer mask that, that hides the, um, the top layer, and then I'm gonna use the brush key, the brush tool to paint that back in, all right? So if I um, hold down the uh, control key and click on this, all right? So I'm gonna do that, the wrong one. What I wanna do is, oops, this way. Oh, I guess I'm not hitting the right button there. I'm gonna invert my mask. There we go. All right, so now I hit dad, and I wanna grab my brush tool, and I'm gonna have that set to white, and I want to just paint on there where there we go. And so on the in the middle of the express keys, we have our touch ring, right? And this can also be customized. There's actually four different settings that you can be customized in here, and they can even be application specific. And so I have this configured to change the size of my brush. So just by moving my finger back and forth, up and down on this touch ring, I can change the size of, of the brush, all right? Another useful- Do you have um, different settings for Lightroom on your express keys than you do on Photoshop? Yeah, I'll, I'll pull that up so you can see. For the most part, what I have is as much consistent as possible with a couple little differences, all right? Because my brain can only hold so many pieces of, of different information. Um, so that, um, changing the brush key, I mean, changing the brush size, the, the keyboard shortcut is the same for both Photoshop and Lightroom. So that one is the same, all right? Um, but I'll show you my settings so you can see. For the most part, I try to make it as consistent as possible. Again, just to develop that muscle memory so when you're reaching for things, the right, the right thing will appear. So inside of my brush settings, I just want to point out that if we go to Shape Dynamics, one of the controls is size jitter. So that's the size of the brush, all right? And if that's set to pen pressure, all right, then the, how hard I press on the brush is going to control how big or small that brush is going to be, all right? You can also set the minimum diameter for how big or how small that brush is gonna be allowed to go, all right? And so for most things, I don't need the brush to go down to a pinpoint, all right? I might wanna have it to go small, but not that small. So I have it in about 25% of whatever I've got dialed in for the size of the brush. And so those two controls are ones that I usually have uh, going for most of the things that I, that I wanna brush in there. And so now I can come in here and painting with white. On my mask. So your opacity and your flow rate is the same, 100%? So, what's going on on there? Um, yeah, so if we look at my brush properties, oh yeah, I do have transfer, that's why I have opacity set for bed pressure. I'm gonna turn opacity off for now. Um, 
So all I want, all I want to have going is uh, pen pressure controlling the size, not the opacity of the brush. Sometimes when you're doing retouching, having opacity part of it is, is really useful too, so you can build that in. But at this point, I want to be able to just brush this bird in there without kind of fading it in. I want to just be able to bring that right in there. That's what was happening, is I had opacity for pen pressure, and I was pressing not too hard, and so only a little bit was coming through. All right. Um, so when I have the bird in well enough, and obviously I could finesse and spend more time, but I, I don't want to waste my time on that. Um, so you can see what's different in when I'm in Photoshop, if I press the same buttons that open those on-screen uh, keypads there, in Photoshop, I have a different set of buttons inside of Photoshop. All right. So those two bottom buttons on my express keys are the ones that I use to open these on-screen controls. When I'm in Photoshop, they open up Photoshop-specific controls. When I'm in Lightroom, they open up Lightroom-specific controls. All right. And so when I'm inside of Lightroom, I mean inside of Photoshop, I sent the image over from Lightroom. Now that I did the work that I want to do, all I want to do is save. So I have the save button programmed in right here. I tap on save. It saves the image. And then I have the eraser set to close, all right? And so just tapping that is now going to close the image. And I already saved it, but I'll hit yes again. And now that closed out. So there's a keyboard shortcut to go from Lightroom over to, uh, over to Photoshop, but there isn't anything that go necessarily back inside of Photoshop that's going to send it back to Lightroom. But as soon as we send that image over to Photoshop and hit the Save button, that photo is then automatically saved to the same folder as the source photos and automatically added to the Lightroom catalog. So all I need to do is get myself back over to Lightroom. So there's a gesture that I have programmed in here, just four finger swipe across, and that opens up this application switch. All right. So now I just do is tap on my Lightroom, and then there's the TIFF file that I just made that has the two birds in it. All right. So they're automatically added in there. So the work, way that workflow would normally go for me is to bring it into Lightroom, make my adjustments, send it over to Photoshop, do my edits, hit save, hit close, swipe over, switch back to Lightroom, and there's that my edited image already waiting for me. So now that you've seen how these controls work a little bit, let me call up the. Um, what you do in the Photoshop clone at the same time, close the Photoshop clone at the same time in the Lightroom, just like that? Well, it doesn't clone it. It's the same photo. It's the same workflow? Oh, if, if I was cloning, is that what, you, is yeah. that what you're asking? Yeah, so he's asking, if I, if I was doing retouching and cloning, that same workflow would apply. Anytime I'm starting in Lightroom, which is my go-to place for all of my photographs, I do all the, whatever I can do inside of Lightroom, and then I send it to Photoshop if needed. Not every image needs to go to Photoshop, but if I do, and whatever I'm doing in Photoshop, I just save it when I'm done, close it, and I'm back in Lightroom, and that photo is automatically going to appear right inside of, right inside of Lightroom for me. Lightroom. Yeah. Just by, just, you, you want to use the file save, not file save as. All right, just remember that. So I just have the save uh, programmed in. If you had your keyboard out, Command or Control S does the same thing. Does it also differ if you have a Lightroom 4 and a Lightroom CC? So if you had an older version of Lightroom and an older version of Photoshop, the, wor the workflow would be the same. All right? It works the same way. That's a feature that's been in Lightroom. That integration between Lightroom and the, and the current version of Photoshop has been there all along. All right, let me just move on and show you uh, where these settings coming are, are coming from here. So. Here we go. So this is the the Wacom Tablet Properties control, all right? And inside of here is where you can customize all these different things that I've been talking about and you've seen on screen, all right? So let me just go through these each a little bit. And if I was on this, we would see the Intuos uh, Pro 5 would, would be appearing, um, and I can, otherwise, the, the same options are going to be present in both. So the first thing I'll show you is my express keys, all right? And so for all my programs, really I've only customized these keys for, for Lightroom and Photoshop, which are the two that I use the most on here, all right? And so my express keys, the top one there, all right, that turns touch on and off. Now, I find that the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro does a really good job of making it a differentiating between my hand touching the screen and the pen if I'm coming down and, and working at the same time. I, my hand at this moment is not doing anything all right, to the screen. But I can switch over and use my finger if I need to 
and pull the pen out of the way, all right? But if there's sometimes, if I'm doing something and my hand is accidentally causing a zoom or something to happen that I don't want, that top button I have set to just disable touch. And so now touch is totally turned off and nothing from my finger input is going to do anything, only the pen now. So if I need something that is guaranteed to only be controlled by the pen, I can just turn that off with a single button. The next one I have down, you can set it to open and a program. So I have it, the second button set to actually open launch Photoshop. So when I pull this machine out and I'm ready to do some work, what I'll do is hit that button and open Photoshop right up. Now you might say, well, why don't you have Lightroom configured in there? So let me, let me show you the reason why I, I don't, because I this is a major help desk uh, pet peeve of mine, and or at least pain point that I've experienced over the years is that a lot of people don't know where their Cat Lightroom catalog is located, and maybe they accidentally opened the wrong catalog, and the whole lots of confusion and hair loss and tears has resulted from all of that. All right, so a very simple way to make sure that you're always opening the right catalog is what I have here on my desktop is just an, an alias or shortcut. So a shortcut on Windows, alias on Mac, that directly goes to my specific catalog file. And so all I have to do is double click on that, and that will launch the specific catalog I want into Lightroom every single time. There's no, there's no wiggle room, there's no accidental anything. It will just open that particular catalog. All right? So if you want to go, well, how do I know where my catalog is? On Windows, go to the Edit menu and Catalog Settings. On Mac, you go to Lightroom menu and Catalog Settings. And in this particular dialog, there's a Show button. It tells me the name, the location, and the name of it right here, but if I click on Show, it opens right inside my file browser, Finder or Explorer, and I can see where that is, and I can go into that folder, and the file with the LRCAT file extension, that's your catalog file, all right? And so all I have to do to make an alias for that is I can right-click on that, and on Windows, I can go to Send To, and there's an option here to Desktop, Create Shortcut. All right, and so right there, I can just send a, sh an, which I already have, it'll create a shortcut right on there um, on my desktop that goes right to that specific catalog file. All right. Um, on Mac, you would use the same control click, it would make an alias, then you gotta drag it over there, it doesn't have the send to menu, but you can do the same thing, all right? So, I could configure that into a button, I could configure that specific file to open up in the button, all right? You leave it on your desktop all the time? I leave it on the desktop all the time. All right. Does that take up more space? No, all it is is an alias. All right, that's just a shortcut that just says go to this file and open it. All right, you can have your catalog stored wherever you want, and the alias can sit there. It's really like a little text file. It's, it doesn't take up any space at all. All right, even if your catalog was on an external hard drive, you could still have that alias come on, you know, from there. Do you have a question back there? I, mean, I don't know if it's a question so much. It's something I recently discovered having used five years. I've been doing the same thing wrong consistently for five years. The same thing wrong. <laughs> as far as I know, which is that I make backups constantly. Right. But I've always been, with each backup, sub subsequently opened the backup and worked from the backup. I've never gone, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that, I know now, I've just recently found out that that's apparently obvious to everyone, not the thing to do. No, it's actually not, not the first time I've heard that. So the, the issue is that over a period of time, won't say how long, um, uh, the gentleman's been opening up, each time opening up the old, the, the most recent backup catalog to work in instead of going to where the actual working catalog lives. The problem with that is, is twofold, all right? One is you may open the wrong backup catalog that may not, so if, if I exit Lightroom, you may have noticed it, it prompts me to back up my catalog and I hit the skip button. Right? Now, I did some work in there that's now not backed up. So if I opened up the most recent backup I had, it wouldn't include the work that I just did. So I potentially am losing work by going to the backup instead of going to the catalog I was just working in. So what I want you to think about is have one place where your catalog is, and by default, that's in the pictures folder of your operating system. That's where it gets good place. You can put it anywhere you want after the fact, but that's where it goes. The inside pictures, there's a Lightroom folder, and then that is, all right? Wherever it makes the most sense for you to store your catalog, external hard drive, another you know internal drive, however you work is totally fine. Can I just ask, not to get too specific in the weeds, but th that problem never happened to me because I'm pretty careful. But now that I know that's not really the 
way you're supposed to handle it? Is there beyond just continuously working from here on out on the same last backup? Yeah, so the, is there anything else I should do? Or? So he's asking what he should do. It's a bit longer answer, so if you can wait towards the end, I will happily show you what you should do, all right? Just so we don't go too far in the weeds. But it's a good question, and, and definitely happens a lot. And the other par problem with opening up your backup is that periodically, you have, to, you have to control your backup catalog because Lightroom will keep creating backups in that location until your hard drive is filled, all right? Lightroom will create them, create them, create them, never goes back, never touches them again, all right? So you, what you end up having is, let me just, I'll show you where mine are, is I have a Dropbox installed on this computer, and inside of my Dropbox folder, I have a bunch of backup catalogs, all right? And I periodically go through and delete them, all right? If your working catalog is in there, you're gonna end up deleting the catalog that has all your work in it, all right? And I've seen people do that because they didn't realize they were opening up a catalog in the backup location. Then they read a tutorial and said, oh, you should, clean, you should delete all your old backups. And they go, oh, okay, I'll do that, delete. And then they try to open Lightroom and they can't find the catalog and then they realize what they had done, all right? So first rule is know where your catalog is and then make sure you have a specific way to open that catalog every single time. So this is the really like over the head simple way is by having that shortcut or alias to do it. The other step that you can take is once Lightroom opens, all right, uh, go back to that edit menu on Windows, Lightroom on, I mean Lightroom on, on a Mac, and go to preferences, and on the general tab, you can dial in a specific catalog there. All right. This is the default catalog setting, and the default setting is load most recent. All right. This is the cause of a lot of problems. Because if you open, say, a backup, and then close Lightroom, that becomes the most recent catalog you used. And from that point on, if you just launch Lightroom, it's going to go back to that catalog, which may not be the one that you want to have open. All right. So I, I really recommend that you do both of those things all right, and then dial in the specific catalog that you want to open every time, so that there's no no problem there um, in, in what gets opened. Right, you want to be in the driver's seat for those those decisions and not not leave it to chance. All right, so let me come back on here. So yeah, so for your express keys, you can have it do some of the functions that are specific to maybe the tablet, uh, to the mouse, keyboard shortcuts different commands, zooming and panning, uh, have it open up applications, switch between programs. These are all my different on-screen controls that I have, turning touch on and off, and so on. Or you can disable them if it's something maybe you don't need and, and you're still learning. So when I first started doing this, you know, there's a default settings for all of these. You might find that some of them work and some don't work for you, and you're going to change them. And then you're going to start working and go, geez, I really wish I had access to this key or this shortcut or this thing. Mm -hmm. And then you can keep going back and tweaking these. And I really recommend that you use it and you keep customizing these for how you work and what makes the most sense for you. If you, if you have a keyboard, then maybe some of those shortcuts you go to the keyboard. But if you want to move away from the keyboard in, in this particular device, you have a lot of options for doing that. All of these on-screen controls also work with this without having the, you know, without having the, the Wacom Mobile Studio Pro. So I do use them on here as well. Even though I can't touch with my finger on this screen, I can just use the pen to, to touch them uh, using the tablet, okay? So they still work in, in both places. What, what about the, the stupid question? Is can you use the Windows 10 version of the Wacom on, as a tablet on the Mac? No. no. Well. I think I know where you're going, all right? So I can't use, okay, so let me, let me rephrase, okay? So make sure we're clear. So there's an option, and I actually, can, and I actually use this when I travel. Um, you can use the, using the USB-C, and for this device, because I have Thunderbolt on here, if I had USB-C, I could go directly USB-C to USB-C. Um, but there's a little device I can pull out, but um, that allows this, device essentially function as the screen for this, all right? So I would see my Mac OS screen on here, open up all my programs, and essentially this is just running this computer. And so now I can have this happening, but with my Mac, all right? The way I use that is when I go to trade shows, I have my Mac sitting in front of me, this sitting out, 
for customers coming by. That way customers can now grab the pen and use and get in here and use it, and I can be controlling things on the backside as well. So it, is that what you asked? Well, I thought you said, is, is there a Mac version? Is, and I, I'm, no, no, okay. not a Mac version. Whether or not you can use that you can use this as a screen. As a screen. The, the Mac is a. Yes, screen. the answer is correct. Okay. Yes, you can. But the computer functions of this are not accessible to you, so um, you would really be using this computer, but this is now your screen, all right? And so I, I, I use it in both ways, and I find it to be a really versatile thing, because I can, now I essentially can bring two displays with me everywhere I go. Um, and, and this does fit in my bag. It's tight, but it fits, all right? And I fit all, everything in here in one bag when I came in here today. Um, all right, so moving on, so you can see there's a lot of different controls here, but I can now customize these for light. So if I tap on my Lightroom icon here, you're gonna see that some of these stay the same and some of these change, all right? And so as soon as I change this over, all right, my, my modifier keys all stayed the same because I want those to be consistent. My on-screen control options change on the bottom, all right, because these are specific to Lightroom. And if I go over to Photoshop, those on-screen controls on the two bottom ones are Photoshop specific. But all the other things, for the most part, stay the same. And so that's why I try to keep it as consistent as possible. And the same thing is true on the pen. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. All right, so on the pen, when I have the pen selected, you can see that I have the top button is set my right click I've been mentioning, and the bottom is set to Alt or Option. That's just how I like it. You can have it set up however you want. You can also control the eraser. All right, and so um, the key that I often find that I use is actually Control W, which is the close button. So if I'm on a, web, I might have a, a web browser open with a bunch of tabs, and I need to close them, I hit Control W on my keyboard. I just now can just tap the back of the pen, and it does the same thing. If I'm in Photoshop, tapping the back of the pen closes the open document. So I use that kind of consistently. The one place where it's different is in Lightroom where I have a little different function. Lightroom, the, the control W doesn't close, because I don't want it to close anything. So I use it for my before and after. So I can just turn the pen around and just tap that on the back, and I can switch between my before and after, which I can show you. And then we have our touch options, where you can use different gestures, OK? So here I have under my gestures things that I can control, things that are built in, all right? And you can, you'll have so, somewhat different options on the Intuos, on, on, on the Mac, but the basics are kind of the same. And I try to have them pretty much the same between the two when I'm moving between the two, because again, it's hard to remember, keep your brain uh, switching between all those different things. So this sweat, swipe left to right to navigate with three fingers, I could do that and scroll. I use four fingers, and that's how I switch between the applications, all right? One of the things I can do is with five fingers is this option to see an overlay of all the settings that I have configured. So if you ever forget what, what, what's configured in there, I have that gesture to go, OK, well, it's like face palm. Like, what do I got going on here? And just five finger swipe down and have that come up and see what's going on. Um, a five finger tap, and I'm in Photoshop, automatically will save the document. So I really, really recommend is incorporating that touch the pen is awesome, all right? The pen gives you control and pressure sensitivity and the buttons on here, but having this added ability to do gestures and touch takes it to a whole new level and gives you a whole lot more control. All right, so you can totally customize those on an application-specific basis, all right? So let's just look at another example of what, what you can, you know, how to incorporate things into your workflow. Um, so on this image, let's take it into uh, develop. Now this was shot uh, really kind of wide open and you could see that there's some um, chromatic aberration happening in those highlight contrasty areas as well as up in the corners of this image. So one of the powers inside of Lightroom we saw a little bit earlier was to apply a lens correction that took care of distortion in the image um, but also 
uh, removed some vignetting around the outside edges. So you saw that I had a, pre uh, a preset for that. So I'm going to just tap on my Enable Profile Correction. And you can see the outside edges got a little bit brighter. This is a 50 millimeter lens, so not a whole lot of distortion in there. But if I zoom in, um, by clicking that preset, let me come down here my lens correction. If I turn off this remove chromatic aberration, if you just look up in this corner, right up here along this high contrast edge, there's a little bit of green chromatic aberration. I don't know how what's coming off there, but just checking that one box took care of that. It didn't get rid of what's happening on his beard and on the saxophone here. So I think it's a saxophone. Purple fringing, yeah, chromatic aberration, purple fringing, all right? And sometimes, though, it's not purple, it's green, okay? So we have some green fringing here as well, along the hairs and along the side of his shirt, and then it's very magenta purple here. It was green in the corner, but that got removed. So checking that box helped, but didn't take me all the way. So if I come over to the manual tab, we could see that there's these options for defringe, all right? There's a purple and there's a green. Then we can change the range of the purple hues and the range of the green hues. But how do you know how much to use? So I can't just grab the uh, amount slider and start to increase it and watch until it goes away. right? And this is where that Alt key programmed in is really useful. When you start moving sliders around in the develop module. So if, I, if I press that button down, I now am also using the Alt key and you can see in the tooltip, that Alt appears. All right, so I know I'm using the Alt key. So now as I click and drag with that Alt key involved, now I'm seeing just the places where that fringe is happening. All right, clears that screen away, so now I can just focus on when that fringe is gone. Now there's still maybe a little bit of fringe along here and along here, even though I got most of it gone here. So I can control the range. That Alt key works on the range as well. So if I hold down my Alt key, and increase the range slider. As I'm dragging this out, we're seeing exactly in those dark areas is where I am affecting and increasing this range. So if I bring this down, all right, we can see that fringe. And I bring increase it up, and I'm taking, I'm extending this hue range out to include those magenta reds that were weren't being included just by moving the uh, the default setting. All right. Now I still have the green on his shirt. So I'm going to do the same thing. Hold the Alt key and move out my green amount All right, until I see that go away. That did a pretty good job. If I need to increase the range, I can open up the screen range a little bit more towards the green side. So having that Alt key on there gives me this one-handed move to see a lot more information than I would see otherwise. Now, if you might have noticed, when I moved up uh, working on the purples here, look at his tie. He happened to be wearing a purple tie that matched the chromatic aberration really, really well. All right, so as I'm, in, as I'm removing the fringe, I'm also removing the color and desaturating his tie. All right, so if I do my before and after here, all right, and go to before, there we go. See how his tie, there's a lot of nice color in there. Um, when we come back, all that color is being sucked out of it. All right, so how can we bring that, that color back in there? So one of my controls up here is to bring in my adjustment brush. Now granted, I could have clicked over here. Could have done that, all right? I like having you know go one place to go. The great thing about the adjustment brush is that shortcut works even if I'm in the library module. So if I'm in the library module and I know I'm going to brush, I could just hit that K button in grid view, and I'm going to jump right over to the, to the develop module with the brush active and ready to go. That's why I have it incorporated on there, even though I could have hit it on here. All right, so I have my adjustment brush. If I come over to, to the defringe option here, and I zero that out, I can now come over here and just brush on his tie and remove all that defringe adjustment that I made to bring back the color in his tie. All right? So if I just brush on here, oops, my exposure is still plus four, so let's turn that. So if you double click on any one of these sliders, it resets it. If you double click on effect, it resets all of them. All right? Which I usually what, it's usually what I do when I'm not talking is I'll double click effect, zero out everything, and then I'll just dial in the control that I want. And I just want to turn defringe all the way down. All right, so here's my adjustment. If I turn on my, my mask overlay so we could see where I'm brushing, all right, that red is just the mask that shows where I'm brushing. And I'm mostly concerned with his tie. And 
And are you using the pen pressure to, to do the opacity? I'm doing that, although I'm pretty much going full on. There's, okay. there's nothing nuanced about this particular adjustment is that I want to remove everything inside of, uh, on his tie because there wasn't any chromatic aberration on his tie. It was just a purple tie. Now, you can see that I, I went over, a little bit of overspray outside of there, all right? This is where that Alt key comes in again. So if you press the Alt key while you're in the brush, it goes to the eraser, all right? So I don't need to do anything else while I'm working to just switch right to the eraser just by pressing that Alt key. And that's why I like having that on the bottom of the brush. I use that all the time. And I can just come in here and erase. And here's where I would probably use a little more uh, pressure uh, just to be a little more nuanced on there. And now there's nothing outside of this that <coughs> is super critical that if I you know, remove the, the uh, denoise, the defringe there, that it's not a problem, but it's nice to have that control. <coughs> so now I'm gonna turn off my mask overlay, and now I brought back all the color in his tie, all right? So using those controls together gives you a lot more than you could do otherwise. So what else? can I do inside of here? If we look back, what we talked about earlier under camera calibration, it's on Adobe Standard, all right? I could have used my camera standard, didn't make too much of a difference. What about my auto adjustment? Now, this was shot really super wide open. The sun was like right up there, so it's really kind of washed out. So one of the other controls inside of uh, Lightroom and Effects is dehaze. I could try doing a little dehaze and seeing if Oops, wrong way there. If I can bring some of that contrast back in there. Now, when I did my auto, oops, we didn't even talk about detail, we will. Um, it increased the vibrance and saturation, all right? That might be something that not really helping him out, so I can use my preset just to zero that out in a single click, all right? Um, DHS is only in Lightroom CC, not in Lightroom 4? Not in Lightroom 4. It actually came around in, when Lightroom first went to the CC uh, version, which was at, at the same time Lightroom 6 came out, but it was only in the subscription-based version of Lightroom. So dehaze is, is relatively new, but, uh, but yes, it's definitely can be useful more on hazy skies than in this situation. Um, and I feel like you know, the white bounce with, this, with the sun shining in there, I think it might look a little bit better if I just brought that up and made it a little bit feel a little bit warmer overall. All right, so again, just using those controls in there gives you a lot more uh, efficiency in, in your movement. Let me switch back to grid view here and look at uh, another image I want to show you. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to hit D just to jump on over to develop. Um, and let me make sure I'm on my... <clears throat> start state, all right? So um, in this image, what I wanted to try to do was really enhance the sparks from the steel wool. Um, and another new feature in Lightroom, in Lightroom Classic is what's called uh, our range mask that's part of our local adjustments. And so what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to just affect the orange in, this, in these sparks to enhance that without doing anything to the sky or the surrounding area, all right? So I'm gonna grab, let's just use a graduated filter. The way I like to think about the graduated filter is this little cross here, this little cursor, I think of it as like a plane going through the sky. And as a plane's going through a sky, sometimes you'll see a little contrail, right, or a chemtrail if you've got to wear a tinfoil hat, um, coming along behind it, all right? The place where the contrail is is where it is getting a full dose of whatever settings you've dialed in. The point in front of the plane hasn't met the plane yet, no settings are happening there. So that's how I like to think about it. So if I just click and, and drag upward, all right, we can see that all happening behind it is getting the full dose of whatever adjustments I've got dialed in right now. All right. Um, let me show you one other thing. If I hold down the shift key while I do that, it's going to constrain it to a nice perfect horizontal as well. All right. So that's not the move I wanted to make. So if I come over to my effect label here and double tap on that, it's going to reset all my sliders. And so 
I want to affect all those sparks. All right, how can I how can I do that? Well, down at the bottom of this is the local adjustment for uh, the graduated filter, but it appears for the radio filter and for the adjustment brush as well. Down at the bottom, I've got my range mask. And there are two options for range mask. There's color and luminance. I'll show you a luminance example later on, but I want to look at color. And what this allows us to do is sample some colors inside of here and focus this mask to just be on the colors that we are targeting. All right. I'm going to turn on the mask overlay just by tapping this box here. So we can see this area in red right now is the full area that's being affected by no adjustment dialed in, but when I dial in an adjustment, it's going to appear there. All right. So what I want to do is grab this little color sampler here, and if I just kind of click inside of this range of sparks, all right, I am now sampling that particular part of the image. Now you can see here, let me close this guy, um, we can click and drag for greater accuracy or we can hold the shift key and add multiple samples in there. All right. So if I hold my shift key down, I can try clicking out a little, dragging out a little rectangle here to try and get more of that and see how it spreads out a little further. All right. Um, I can also, Alt key, delete that. All right. I can delete that one too. So again, that Alt key, super handy all right, for doing things. If I hold down the Shift key, I might just sample a few places, mostly inside of the sparks. And what I want to do is just really kind of hone that in on just the, the orange in the sparks. And so by adding all those multiple samples, I've pretty much removed that adjustment from appearing anywhere else in the image. That never was possible for inside a Lightroom. We would have had to gone over to Photoshop and done an elaborate mask to try to separate that all out. I'm going to turn off the mask overlay just so we're not adding that red into it so you can see. But while I'm in here, just so you can also see another way you can visualize this, we have this amount slider. All right. If I hold down the Alt key as I'm moving this amount slider, all right, we're going to see a grayscale mask that's showing where this mask is now being constrained to. All right, that area in white is where this is being affected, and I can, if I need to expand that out further, go in the other direction. But again, having that Alt key right at my fingertip, super, super helpful. So even though my graduated filter is potentially covering almost the entire image, I've constrain that down to just this particular area. So maybe now I can bring up the temperature and warm that up. I can bring in some clarity, boost that up. Uh, maybe I want to bring up saturation. So whatever combination of settings you want to dial in there, you can now target that right in there. Again, a whole lot faster, a lot more efficient uh, than it was before. So let me back on out of that and come back on over to grid view. One more important thing I want to show that, um, and then I'll, I'll take some other questions uh, from you guys that are either Lightroom or Wacom specific. But when, when I brought these initial images in, um, I showed you one way to do it. So I want to just show you quickly, taking advantage of a new feature inside of Lightroom Classic, to make this process maybe go a little bit faster uh, and to change some things. All right, so. I'm going to expand this out so we can see all the possible import options. And up in our file handling panel, instead of build previews, I'm going to choose embedded in sidecar. And what that does is it says, OK, Lightroom, instead of bringing, the, bringing these photos in and then rendering out a new preview that Lightroom decides, it's going, to imp, it's going to import the previews that are embedded inside the actual raw photo. And it makes the process of going through your selects a whole lot faster. Especially if you know that you might delete a bunch of them, right? as in my case. So if you think about it, if what part of what Lightroom has to do is copy the photos to a new location, OK, that has to happen, and then render out these previews. If I'm going to render out, spending time and resources rendering out previews of photos I'm going to delete, that might save me time if I can skip that step. All right? If I'm going to go through these and I want to immediately just be zooming in and checking focus, checking exposure, things like that, I don't need Lightroom necessarily to re-render out a preview. I can just go based on what was the, the camera had embedded. So why would you do one well, that's the choice, right? So eventually, Lightroom has to make its own preview. 
because Lightroom, when you actually go to edit the image, Lightroom has to get rid of that JPEG or that embedded preview and use its own rendering, all right? So that's either going to happen later on when you move on to develop automatically, or from the beginning, if it helps you, because I'm going to show you a thing that you can do to customize your defaults, if you want to see that as your starting point, then you want Lightroom to start by rendering out the previews. So it really is just not necessarily there's one right workflow. You just need to evaluate for you, can I just get by with the previews because that makes my job faster? All right, then go for it. If I want to see Lightroom render things out based on the custom default settings that I'm going to dial in here, then maybe that's how I want to start. All right, it all depends on how you want to work. I just want to expose you to both. Not, I use both depending on what I'm going to be doing. But in this case, I'm going to uncheck all. I'm going to hold down my shift key and just grab a few so you can see. Check this. So I'll just bring in these five. And we're going to rename them as we did before. We could choose to apply a preset. I'm not going to do that because I want to, again, just use the embedded. That would kind of defeat that whole, prop, that whole purpose. And my default um, destination, all those settings were sticky, so I don't need to change any of those. But if I'm going to use this embedded workflow for file handling, because I did change that, I might want to make a new preset for that. So I do have a preset already dialed in that I called Speedy. Right? But the only difference between that and the one-to-one -one is that it changes the preview uh, in the file handling. All right? Otherwise, all the other settings are the same. So depending on how you want to do that, um, you can set that up. So I'll bring those in. Now as these come in, there's going to be somewhat of a, a difference on here, all right? is that up in the upper left corner of each of these images is a new icon, this little double-sided arrow, okay? That's telling you, Lightroom is saying, this is using the embedded preview right now. It's not Lightroom's own preview. If I bring this up to see the full image, come on, you can do it. Oops. Lightroom went ahead and rendered previous. All right. It was working faster than it needed to be. So th my, whole, my whole thing happened so fast on me that I didn't get to show you the, the little bezel that shows you that it's embedded. So now that I've gone through these, if I want to bring in my um, custom defaults, so let me bring this photo on over to develop. If there's a starting point, if I find that every time I come in, I'm always hitting the same buttons, and making the same general adjustments, not specific tonal adjustments. I mean general, you know, uh, global adjustments. I can customize those to be included in my own custom default, so that when Lightroom starts rendering previews, it's using it based on my settings instead of the settings that came out of the box. All right. So we talked about one of those things being the camera profile. All right and that I particularly, personally preferred camera standard over Adobe standard, so I might dial that one in, all right? Now, another thing that you saw I had presets for uh, was my lens corrections, all right, under profile. Remove chromatic aberration, I'd always want that checked, all right? I've not experienced any performance penalty by having that checked, so I always want to have that on. Now, enable profile correction, I can include that in my custom default. But now you have to weigh that out, all right? If I'm experiencing, if I'm on an older machine experiencing performance problems, uh, maybe having that not on by default is a good idea because now Lightroom is going to be rendering out those uh, lens correction, profile corrections for every photo, all right, which is somewhat resource intensive. But if you want to include it, you can. So I'll leave it checked because I might want to include that. Another thing that I like to consider, oops, sorry, is, is my detail settings, all right, for noise reduction and for sharpening. All right, this might not be the best image, but actually that's somewhat in focus for a panning shot, all right? And so if I want to dial in my own custom uh, sharpening, I don't usually change the noise reduction for raw photos. The default 25 for color, I've been happy with, and default at zero for luminance, I've been happy with. But I do often change, I find that I change the sharpening, all right? And if you're wondering a place to start, if you come under the, actually the one set of really useful under Lightroom general presets that ships with Lightroom, there's a sharpened faces and a sharpened scenic, all right? So, 
So if I click on sharpen faces, I want you to look over in the sharpening panel here for what happens to amount radius detail and masking. All right, so if I hit sharpen faces, all right, they change from the defaults. All right, if I hit sharpen scenic, they change from sharpened faces. What's the difference? Well, if you think about general images falling into two very broad categories of either people pictures or not people pictures, all right, then these two uh, default uh, or presets for sharpening kind of make sense, all right? For sharpened faces, all right, the amount slider um, isn't as high. All right, because maybe we're not wanting to sharpen the, all the pores and hairs and things on the person's face. All right, um, the radius uh, on sharpened faces is larger than on sharpened scenic. Because the thing about faces is having these kind of wide open areas of detail, as opposed to a, a scene with lots of really high frequency detail. All right, so more high frequency detail, smaller radius. All right, and then uh, the, the detail slider, you know, for faces. Um, is a little bit lower. It's trying not to bring in uh, unwanted detail and sharpen that. Whereas on Sharpen Scenic, it's a little more like, yeah, let's bring, let's apply more sharpening to more things, all right? And then for masking, uh, for faces, masking is really high up, all right? What does masking do? Well, masking, when masking is at zero, all the settings that are dialed in above are being fully applied to the entire image. All right? If I hold down the Alt or Option key and start to bring up masking, Lightroom automatically generates a mask based on the edges and the detail. All right? And so if you think about this type of capture sharpening, all you really want to do is sharpen the details, the important details. You don't need to apply sharpening to open areas of uh, out of focus backgrounds or wide expanses of somebody's face or a blue sky. All right, think about a blue sky is where a lot of that noise, uh, those blue pixels tend to be the noisy pixels, all right? And you have a low ISO, blue, beautiful day, blue sky, and you make some adjustments and you see noise, you see luminous noise. So why, why sharpen that noise? All right, if you can avoid sharpening the noise, you can get away with using less noise reduction. So just by bringing that masking slider up, we're seeing that really the most important details right around the midpoint, on around 50, are being included, and everything else is not being included in this. All right, so for a face, that makes a lot of sense. For something more scenic, maybe you want to have that masking slider set on a lower value. Right? No necessarily one right answer. Uh, when these presets were made, the scenic masking was set at zero, and the sharpened faces was uh, set at 60. All right? So if you're someone's like, well, I'm not sure where to begin, those two are a good place to start. And then you can tweak from there for, for what you prefer. All right? So I, I personally shoot more scenic than faces, so I'll use that as my default. But I do like to involve some masking, so I'm just going to bring that up around 35, 40 or so, all right? So now that I've dialed those settings in, could I include other things? I could, if I wanted to include auto, or if I wanted to include other things, I could include that in my default. I'm not gonna do that, because I've got presets that I can very quickly turn those on and off. So now that I've dialed all those in, how do I make them my um, default? If I come up to the develop menu, come down to set default settings, we see this dialog appear that's a little scary, because it says, Please note these changes are not undoable, right? That just means that you can't use the edit undo function to get out of this. You can always, you can spend all day long recustomizing your default settings to your heart's content. You can absolutely redo it. Or you could come over to restore Adobe default settings and go back to the same way it was when you first launched Lightroom. So this is not a lifelong commitment by any stretch, okay? But when you do it, you just lose, for that moment, I can't use my edit undo to kind of step back through whatever I just did. So under the develop menu, uh, set default settings, and it opens that up. So what you want to do is take a raw image, okay, so really only, this only applies to raw images, hit the reset button so there's no settings applied to it, and then only dial in the settings you want. Because if you dial in some other weird setting, like plus four exposure, that's going to be included in your default. You don't want to do that. You only want to have dialed in what you want to be applied to every photo. And in this case, you can see it's camera specific. So this is only going to be changing the defaults from my Nikon D850. 
if I pull out a Nikon D610, this has no effect on raw photos from that camera. If I bring in photos from my phone, it has no effect on those, okay? So this is camera specific. So if you were to do this, you would do this for every camera that you use, all right? Um, what about images that are JPEG and just form to raw? So if you're shooting JPEG, the camera, your camera is, is applying whatever settings are dialed into your camera yeah. to that JPEG. When you bring that JPEG into Lightroom, Lightroom doesn't do anything to it. Yeah. Doesn't apply any settings. I, I uh, went from uh, uh, Photoshop and was converted to RAW. You can't yeah. convert a photo to RAW. Yeah. All right. Once a photo is a JPEG, it's a JPEG. All right. Technically, you might be able to convert it to DNG, but it's not making it a RAW photo. All right. Oh. So. Your, once it becomes a JPEG or a TIFF or a PSD, it's a rendered file, and Lightroom's defaults don't. Lightroom's defaults for non-raw photos is to do zero to them. Okay, until you you can make any changes you want, but Lightroom's default is to not make any changes. All right. So in this case, uh, I'm making it just for my Nikon. So I would choose update current settings, and so now if I select another photo in this batch. And let me come down to, say, camera calibration so we can see. It's set to Adobe Standard. If I hit my reset button, it just changed it to camera standard. It applied the lens correction, all right? It just applied all of those settings because the default, when you hit reset, it goes back and resets it to the default settings. So if I were to go back to grid view for this batch of photos now, if I wanted to now include those settings with all these, all right, I can select this one here. Hold down my shift key, select the top one here. Um, in quick develop, we have a reset all, right? It just reset them all to my custom default settings. So now, from now on, any more photos I import from this camera are gonna have those settings baked in, or not baked in, but applied right from the get-go. So when I go back to my import settings, if I wanna see, get to, my separating the wheat from the chaff really fast without waiting for Lightroom to render, I'll use embedded and, pre and um, the embedded preview and just work with that. When I start developing, then Lightroom then updates the preview and re-renders it, okay? If I wanna start from the place from my custom default, then I would choose, personally, the one-to-one -one option so that Lightroom will automatically render out those previews based on my custom defaults, and that's where I'm making my evaluation from. So it depends on what you, where you want. Do you want to evaluate the camera as JPEG, or do you want to evaluate your own RAW file, uh, your own custom RAW setting? No wrong answer there, as long as it makes sense to you and helps you move through on your workflow. But your presets would also apply to smart previews. So, What's a smart preview? So the question is, do, do presets apply to a smart preview? And so a smart preview is a, essentially a compressed, smaller version of the raw file that gets stored in a special cache file alongside the, the catalog file. And if my photos were, say, offline, maybe, maybe I had some that were on here and they're not accessible, but I had a smart preview rendered, I could bring that photo the smart preview into the develop module, make adjustments to it for all of those settings, and then as soon as this drive became back online, Lightroom would seamlessly reconnect to the original RAW file, and anything applied to the smart preview, presets included, would be applied to the original RAW file. All right. So working with smart previews is a very useful workflow if you're someone that stores your photos on an external device and it's not always connected. And you want to be able to edit uh, when, when it's not connected. So if you say, well, I, I know this drive is going to be offline. Let's pretend that it's, they're stored on here even though we, we know that they're not. I can come up to my library menu, go to previews, and I can build out smart previews for all of those photos. Now those smart previews will get rendered and stored in that special cache file, so once this drive went offline, I could continue editing. So I'll do that if I'm storing things on here, I get on the plane, I'm not gonna pull this out, but if I had the foresight to render out those smart previews, I can just pull this out and work from the smart preview. It's, there's nothing I need to do about it, it's just automatically taken, taken care of, sorry. Can you export to JPEG from smart preview? Um, I don't think that you can. I'd have to force that to try, because I haven't done that. But I think you can edit. You might be able to get a small. So 
Smart previews are this, in, in, inhabit this funny space in that you can use in this offline workflow. If you sync with Lightroom CC on mobile, it's the smart preview that gets uploaded to the cloud, and that's what I would experience on my phone or my, my, my iPad or my Android tablet. And you can absolutely, from those mobile devices, save out from, the, from that smart preview, save out JPEGs to put on social media or email or whatever. So, I think it's possible in that way. I'm not 100% sure you could do it from here. I'd have to test it to make 100% sure. Can. But it's an easy test to do. Sorry? You can't do it from here. Smart preview without the original file. I, that's what I'd have to test. Oh. Because it's an easy test to make. Make a smart preview, pull your drive offline safely, see if you can export. All right? And that and that's what I would that's what I would do. Um, All right, I got to do it. I got to do it. Good. Ask your question. With clearing out files, um, Delete them from the catalog. <coughs> um, do you have to delete a smart preview separately from another file that's in there? No, if you've got smart previews and say you delete the originals, Lightroom tries to intelligently clean, you know, the smart previews out too. Okay. All right. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm forcing this to be pretending that it's uh, that it's offline um, by making the that particular photo that I just rendered a smart preview for. And I'm just changing the file name, all right? So Lightroom will say, hey, all right? So now it just went to Smart Preview here. So that Smart Preview is what's being uh, managed here by Lightroom. So let me see if I can export copy out of there. Hey, I can, all right? So there's the answer to your question. Let's open this up in Explorer and hit Export. And there it is. So yes. Yes is the answer to your question. You can export a smart preview. Now, it's going to be small, right? So a smart preview, these raw files were 45 megapixel raw files, all right? Pretty big. Um, the smart preview is about, think of it about a 3,000 on the long side pixels. So much, much smaller. But well, when you export it's offline. Raw, you're exporting it to JPEG anyways. For and you're probably, you might be reducing it in pixel dimensions. Except for like large print, right? Well, it depends on your needs, right? You always think about it in pixel dimensions. If you need something that's X pixel dimensions, and that X is bigger than the length of the smart preview, then you need to go to the original raw file. If that X is smaller, you know, fits in that smart, then that, then that could work. How do you find the pixels of the smart preview? All right, so right above uh, here is the original raw files pixels. All smart previews, I have to look it up, but they're like, 2,800 pixels. It's some, it's some number like that. I want to say it's like 2,820 or something. Some, I, I just think of it about 3,000 pixels. Basically more than enough for Instagram. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. What about like 8 by 10? Yeah. It, it probably. You're right. And, and I would do, what I would do is if that's something that I thought, huh, that could work in my workflow, I would do a test. Do a test run. And could that work? And if I'm satisfied with the results, then it works. Uh, and if, if I'm not, then you've got to work around it. But there's no better thing than just doing it yourself. So in the, this is in the library, and you can always see the, dim, the pixel dimensions. Yeah, so in, in grid view of the library, you can set this up to display different information. All right, so I'm just clicking on this. And there's all these different things I can have displayed there. All right, what I want to have here is cropped uh, dimensions. So I choose that. And that shows me the pixel dimensions after the crop. In this case, there's no crop applied, so it's the full size. And then, how do you see the smart preview dimensions? You click like all smart previews are the same size. Oh. All the same. So what is it? 28 something. Okay. I have to look it up, but it's not a number I I, I store in this little tiny brain of mine. So you're not doing smart previews anymore. I don't generally, but I do if I know there's going to come a point where I want to uh, work offline with them, all right? And in this particular catalog, so in my collections panel, I have this thing called, I call it catalog dashboard. This is somewhat off, but related. Um, these are all different smart collections that I've created based on, in this case, file type. And in this case, I've got five smart previews, the same five that I just made up. All right, so all this smart collection is, is you can think of it as a saved search, all right? And in this case, my smart collection, I just saved, has smart preview is true. And so this tells me at a glance how many smart previews are in this catalog, all right? If I were to select 
one of these photos that's that's st actually still online, I can go up to my photo, uh, to, excuse me, to my library menu, come down to my previews, and I can discard the smart preview. Let's say just discard that one, because maybe I don't need it anymore, and you can see that number went down to four. So you can manage your, if you want to get in the weeds on that, you can manage your smart previews, but for the most part, what Lightroom does is uh, manage, that, manage that for you. But how did you get there? Uh, so that's under the library menu. So library, previews. All right, and from there you can build your standard size, your one-to-one, -one, and your smart previews. And you can also discard your one-to-ones, and you can discard your smart previews too. Yeah, question regarding smart previews, like the mobile. Um, this morning when I on the bus, I noticed that um, when I was looking at Lightroom Mobile, it was loading the smart preview uh, for each picture I went to. In the past, I used to use Edit Offline. Uh, it, that's gone. No, it's still in there. You can still edit offline. So if you're using the Lightroom CC for mobile app, say on a phone or a tablet, all right, it's totally a little bit off topic, but I'll just, just answer that. Um, it's using the smart previews that get uploaded from your classic catalog to the Adobe Cloud, and then you see on your device the smart preview, all right? If you're going to go, say, get on a plane, because that's typically a place where I don't have internet, um, before you get on the plane, you can uh, say edit, uh, edit those to be working offline. It downloads all those smart previews to the device, and then you can work offline. Then when you get back online, the settings get synced back to uh, the cloud, and then eventually back down to your classic catalog. So you can, he's saying you can resize the pixel dimensions larger uh, if you need that. Um, it's not something, if you have the original raw file, Go to that instead of upsizing the smart preview. <laughs> All right, if that's you know if you had a choice for quality wise, but yes, it's it's possible to take a photo and to increase its pixel dimensions using the software. Lightroom can do it. There are plugins can do it. Photoshop can do it. But generally speaking, if you if that's all the difference is, is smart preview versus original, go to the original and and you'll be fine. All right. Um, one yes. So the, if you delete the original files from like I store them in external hard drives to keep. You go to delete those pictures individually in the external hard drive. Will the smart preview caches delete along with Yeah, so if I wanted to say delete. If you're outside of Lightroom. Well, you want to do the deleting inside of Lightroom. And then it'll delete them from the external drive as well? Yeah. Yeah, if, once you import the photos into Lightroom, you want go, Lightroom is now your tool to manage those photos, to rename them, to move them to different folders, to delete them. Anything you're going to do, go to Lightroom. Because that updates the file on the disk, wherever it happens to be, but it also updates the catalog. If you deleted them all outside of Lightroom, you'd end up with a bunch of exclamation points on your thumbnails and potentially question marks on your folders, because Lightroom is still looking for them. It doesn't know what you did. Now, you could then clean up the catalog by removing them, because you know you deleted them, but don't. it's easier just to select them inside of Lightroom and uh, and delete them. So if I just take these photos here and just delete them, oh, I'm in, a, I'm in a smart collection. So let me go to the folder where they're stored. All right. Um, I could delete them from here, and they would be removed from the drive. All right. I want to show you one more cool trick with this Alt key that's like my favorite thing on the pen. All right. And so if you look over in my folders panel, let me just expand this so you can see a little bit bigger. I've got a lot of I got a parent folder and a lot of subfolders, and then subfolders in those subfolders. Um, there is now a filter inside of the folders panel, so if you know the name of a folder, you can just type in the name, and it will filter down to just the contents of that that matches that. Okay, so. Uh, I thought I had some Yosemite things in here, so we'll go to New York, all right? And so that's probably a fast way to, instead of scrolling up and down the panel. But if you're just not sure, you don't remember the name of a specific folder, and you've got this big long list, this is the cool little tip. So if you hold down that Alt or Option key, uh, and you click on the parent folder, it collapses all of those subfolders in one click, all right? And so I, I, how much time I spent always going tap, 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 and uh, having to do that all individually. So just hold down the Alt key and click on the disclosure triangle on the top one, right? 
and then when you click, take your finger off the Alt key, oh, so I kept reopening them all, all right? Super time saver, all right? So if nothing else, Alt key on here, all right, is a huge win uh, for, for just about anything you're doing inside of Lightroom. So I think I'm getting near the end, but I do want to make sure I answered uh, this gentleman's question on how to do his thing. Thank you so much for coming out on this snowy night.